Church of the Nazarene. So for you that don't know Mark, I uh, want you to know he is the Reverend Dr. Mark Cote. So he's bringing it to Hersey. We're just thrilled to have him and his wife Kristen uh, with us. Um, they have children, Caleb 18. What school is he going to? I forget. He's at Karen University. Yes. And then Jacob 17, Rachel 14. And then they had a beautiful uh, daughter, Victoria Grace, who lives six days and is in heaven with Jesus. Uh, today, and we celebrate her life today. But uh, Mark's an ordained elder, uh, got ordained in the Church of the Nazarene. He's got a vast um, history. He's been a missionary in Peru. Uh, currently, Mark is the director of Safe Place Ministry today. He provides training, guidance, and care for pastors, missionaries, educators. He's also a professor at uh, LBC, adjunct professor there. Uh, you're you're going to want to get to know Mark. Now, don't try to grab him. Don't try to recruit him. Uh, he lives. The, he is the closest living pastor to the Hershey Church of the Nazarene, and we want to keep him. So welcome, Mark. Would you do that? I, I don't want to miss it. Is, is anyone else a first time here at PCDC? I don't want to miss anyone at all. Could somebody introduce him? How about I introduce myself? Yes, that'd be great. I can do that. Thank uh, you. John Bogart from Promised Land. Awesome. Great to have you here, my brother. Let's welcome John. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. show up to here and I'll be honest with you I, I shared this with the congregation on Sunday that I don't really need another PCDC I don't really need another sermon I don't need I mean I, I promise you at last Tuesday of every month I try to show up to our prayer zoom meeting but I really need you and I really need the goodness of God. So I, I choose to show up to these things, not because I necessarily want to, but I want to be close to where the Lord wants me to be. And bringing you folks around me just helps me to be more accountable to Him. So I wanted to share this with you. Is Bud here today, by the way? I don't see him. So I wish he was, because what I'm happy. I'm sorry? Yeah, there's, I know there's traffic. There was an accident on, on uh, the turnpike coming and, and those kind of things. I said all that to say this to you. I need to make our gatherings a priority in my own life. I could choose to stay home. In fact, I could choose to say, 
you know, I, I really can have other things to do. And, and some of you would say maybe important things to do. But in my own relationship with the Lord, I need to draw close to Him. And I do that by showing up and being present uh, and these kinds of, of things, meeting folks and talking to my brother, where's Wesley at back there, and excited for what God's doing in calling Del, brother. I mean, I'm just telling you, brother. So I have a friend. By the way, go Phillies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a Philly fan. Go Phillies. I'm happy for y'all. Listen, I, I say this to you. We really need to be happy for one another. You know? Celebrate one another. Encourage one another because my team's not there I promise you I'm rooting for your team uh, not because we stink but because you're good <laughs> so I tell you that but I have a friend you I'm sure I hope you have a friend and and part of that isolation is um, having friends and then choosing to be friends and, and that'll cost you something it really will it'll cost you time I have a few probably some of my closest friends um, in this room um, Kevin Pastor Carrie and, and others one of my, my best friends uh, lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Gr grew up with him in, in, yeah, in, uh, in a little town. And, and he grew up Catholic. I grew up Protestant. But we are really, really good friends. And he and when we talk, he knows what I believe. And I know what he believes. And, and we get to share together. But I have a friend that shared uh, this with me yesterday. And you might think, well, did you only go over this yesterday? Well, no, I've been leaning into what God wanted me to do since I've been asked to share it today. Uh, and I'm not here to share it to you about the greatest coffee in the world, Wawa, today, so that's unusual, I know. Um, my mug's over there somewhere. somewhere. So I have a friend that shared this, and he read it for the very, very first time yesterday himself. And, and after he read it, he read it again and again and again and again. And, um, and then he shared it. He, I mean, he felt so compelled to share it. And, and I thought it was so meaningful. And if he walks in, uh, obviously it was Bud Reading that shared it. And he shared it at his kitchen table. And I thought it would be good for us to hear it today. It's actually the words of David F. Wells. And it's a book called Above All Earthly Powers. Now, you might say, well, John, why are you sharing about that when we're really doing a devotion? I'd encourage you to read the book, um, but I just want to share one paragraph that Bud shared yesterday with me and for probably with some of you in the room. The Word of God, read or preached, has the power to enter the innermost crevices of a person's being. I want to read that again. The word of God read or preached has the power to enter the innermost crevices of a person's being. To shine light in dark, unwanted places. To explode the myths and deceits by which fallen life sustains itself. And to bring a person, any person, Anytime or anywhere, face to face with the eternal God. It is this biblical word which God uses to bring repentance, to excite faith, to give new life, to sustain that life once given to correct, nurture, and guide his church. Now, you don't have time to write these down, but I'll share them with you later if you want them. If you don't, that's fine. But Jeremiah 23, 29, so we know by heart, 2 Timothy 3, 16, Hebrews 4, 12, James 1, 18. The biblical word is self-authenticating under the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God is the means by which God accomplishes his saving work in his people. And this is a work that no evangelist, no preacher can do. This is why the death of, I'm sorry, the dearth of, or lack of, 
serious, sustained biblical preaching in the church today is a very serious matter. When the church loses the word of God, it loses the very means by which God does his work. I love the paraphrase, but I'm just going to continue to read. That would be good preaching right there. In its absence, we're talking about the word of God. Therefore, a script, I want you to get this, is being written, however unwittingly, for the church's undoing. Not in one cat is, uh, not in one moment, but in a slow slide made up of piece by tiny piece of daily dereliction. Or the state of being abandoned. And I wanted to take a moment this morning just to remind myself. So yesterday when Pastor Bud shared that, I think it was, yeah, it was yesterday, I read it over and over, much like, like Pastor Bud did. And I'm not here to highlight Pastor Bud, but I wanted to give him credit because he's the one that shared it with me. I just thought how important it was for us as pastors of the gospel in a world that is lost in dark, that need to reestablish our foundation on the Word of God. Now, I just want to back up a minute before I share a scripture, just one or two verses here. When I come to these events, where I go to the prayer Zoom meeting, which we love, or prayer retreat, if you haven't, I'm sure you have, be part of prayer retreat. I know Mark's going to join me there as well. It's one of our, in my opinion, one of our best events of the year. I think it's in January, am I right? But when we show up to these things, it draws us closer to Him. Not because I am here or I humbly stand before you, but the Holy Spirit meets with us in a way differently than what, what it is in my own personal devotions. And you encourage me and we encourage each other to be what God wants us individually and collectively to be. Something happens when, when we as a team comes together. I, I uh, got to see the highlights. I didn't watch your game to be honest, but I got to see the highlights of the game and when you have, I don't know how many, 50,000 fans in, in a stadium and, and all that, but what would happen to our church as leaders if we would concentrate more, consecrate more on the Word of God to listen to the church, not just to be preached, but to be lived out for everyone to understand that the Holy Spirit wants to feel and dwell and forgive the lostness of this world. And so as we come together to, to share even this morning the text. So I selected a, a short text. You'll know it better than I do. And I say that to you. But at, actually in chapter 5 of Matthew, which you'll know well. Um, and, I, and I share this with you as pastors today of your church. I don't care whether you're an associate or or children's pastor or whatever, but I believe this is for all of us today. God's word, his holy word, let it penetrate your heart. In just two verses, you are the light of the world. Pastor, friend, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You and I cannot be hidden. Isolation. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may, so they may see your good works and give glory to who? Give glory to the Father in heaven. So I just shared these few paragraphs with you this morning that we jotted down and I think they're powerful words. You know why they're powerful? They're 
They're the gospel. All believers, obviously you know this, are to shine their light of Christ to others. And we do that to inspire them to pursue the worship of God. And another way to say it, to, to really inspire them to read the word of God and apply the word of God. It's sharper than anything. Not because of anything we do, but because we allow Christ to, do, to display himself through us. A year ago, I went to the Board of Ministry. I think that's what they're called. Where's Byron? Can you keep me straight somewhere? Right, by Byron? Is that what it's called? Board of Ministry? Here. Pastor Jonathan was there. And I'm not going to tell you because it would be very humbling for me. It was for my wife. Something that we honestly have fought against doing for many, many years. 20-some years, actually. And Jonathan doesn't know this, but it's something that my wife and I reminisce from time to time from a year ago. He said something to us. There was tears from my wife and I in that room. Isolation, you know? And for 20 years, I sort of lived there without most of you even knowing that. But Jonathan said something to me and my wife, and we'll never forget it. He doesn't know what he said. I'm sure he doesn't remember. <laughs> but we'll remember. He didn't talk to me about Wawa or coffee or anything else. He said something along the lines of, John, since I've known you, you've shown me Jesus. Mm -hmm. I've never said anything to him about that, but he's here today. But that's what the scripture is saying to us, to me. What does it mean for us to reflect God's light? As it heart at its heart, it means that when people sees us and interacts with us, it should be like an interaction with the Father. They should get what He's like. Now, I want you to know that's very humbling to say to you that Jonathan said that to me, Pastor Jonathan. And I want you to know that uh, since that year ago, or really two years ago, when Pastor Terry asked me to, and my wife, and she's my significant person in my life and in my ministry, but like most of yours, not all, but most. And he asked me to go to Hershey. For you that don't know, we've been there for two years, the first week of September. We had 13 people attend our church the first Sunday we were there. We're averaging 65 to 70. We've had up to 92 on a good Sunday. And very little of it has to do with me. Except one thing. My wife and I are striving to be the light of Jesus. Even when it's not convenient, comfortable or anything else. When we arrived there, the only thing I really knew was God called us there. That's all I knew. My wife was more supportive and, and I would say God was calling her more than he was calling me, to be honest. And then uh, my first Sunday there, we, we were singing to a screen nobody up front, nobody leading YouTube. Today we, thanks to Alfreda, who had Pastor Willie and Becky Jimenez on their staff, Jimenez on their staff. Pastor Kevin actually said, John, go get them. They're attending this church, part of Chris's worship team from time to time. He 
You say, man, they could help you. That's where they need to be. You think they're helping us? We had a revival our first week. Stephen Manley was there in October. Because I knew it was very little about me. I haven't preached in many, 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 many years. And it's hard when you walk away for so many years from preaching in a routine. I look back on some of my early messages in October and I sort of chuckle. But I asked the church if we could have revival. And they said, well, Pastor, we can't afford revival. And they couldn't really. They didn't pay a budget, none of those things. But I said, I'm not sure that we can afford to even move forward without myself looking into the heart and eyes of Jesus and, and this church. And I will tell you from that moment on, Jesus just keeps showing up. And it has nothing to do it has all to do with his work, his holiness, and his life. So we now went from zero pastors, zero worship, including me. I was uh, what they call me, Pastor Byron, a little bit supply. And now we have five pastors. Wardian Eller came in. He loves the church. He's as humble as anyone. His wife is precious in marketing. Uh, Pastor Becky and Willie Willie's had a district license at Kevin's church and Pastor Mark's church prior to there. And I think Pastor Mark actually and Emmanuel uh, there. And now Becky has a local license. And Lucas has a, will be coming to Mac weekend uh, with the leadership for his district license. Mm -hmm. So God's doing a great thing. Amen. It's a new day in Hershey. Mm -hmm. If I took you into the community there, you would know that it's a new day. And all I want to do is do what I've been taught in Sunday school and then through a youth group and through college and career is be the light for Jesus is the light. And that light has very little to do with me except one thing. So render it to him. Amen. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, I probably took too much time here this morning. I think I was given 15 but Lord, thank you for being obedient in my own heart that I'd be willing to share what you have to share. Help me to even, Lord, be more like you today and be the light that you want me to be. And it doesn't start here in front of a room of pastors, but it starts with my daughter and my, my wife. And, and really before that, Lord, it starts with you. To be the light that you wanted me to be. And, and whether it's here at PCDC or with my with my peers or uh, the leadership of our district, Lord, that we would be that to the stuffed steaks at the restaurants or, or at the Redners or, or the where, wherever you have us to go today. May we realize even as we get older like myself that we still need to be the light that you've called us to be in these days, in these wonderful days, Lord, where people still need Jesus. Be with us today as Pastor Dave leads us. We ask, Lord, that we'd be better, Lord, because we have met together in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thanks, John. So we appreciate the good word appropriate for our, uh, for our kickoff session for PCDC. Uh, we're talking about developing a, uh, a teaching team. So, but um, <clears throat> before we do that, um, the first thing I want to do is say for all those that are at PCDC today, it's your lucky day because there is a discount on this devotional booklet written by our very own Del Beaver. If you do not have a copy of this, do not leave today without one. Inflation has been operating at 20%, but it, or at 200%, but at great expense to himself, Dell has held down the cost to $12. Dell, how can they get this devotional book? See me, they're in the back right beside me. All right, see Dell. Does everybody know who Dell is? Yes. Dell? Second best looking guy in the room. So when you think who's Dell, just think second best looking guy in the room. 
So, but awesome. Don't leave without the devotional book. Uh, some personal testimonies written in the back of this book is, I thought I knew Jesus until I read this book. Now I really know him. Carrie Willis. No, not really. I made that up. That was, I made that up. So, so, Carrie knew Jesus before he read that book. But, but he does want to give his kudos to Dell's book. Right, Carrie? Yes, he has a copy. Yes, he has a copy. Awesome. All right. And then I believe Mark has a presentation for us today. Mark? Hey, good morning, everyone. You know, October is Pastor's Appreciation, and so we're going to ask um, Pastor Byron Hannon if he'll come forward, and Pastor Mark Justice, and our district superintendent, Pastor Kerry Willis. And we are blessed on the Philadelphia district with a great, great team, and so we want to acknowledge you this morning. So would you please um, stand, and would you just say thank you to their leadership, especially three guys to be right here and uh, Pastor Emmanuel can you just we're all going to gather around them and lay hands on them right I mean how many of you know it's hard to lead these days yeah. right you can't please everybody and they're not out to please everybody but it's just hard to lead and John talked about isolation and it's really hard when you're at the top yep. leading to feel isolated and so we don't want you to feel that way because we're, we're better together right I know that that's a cliche, but that's really true, okay? So if you three could get right here, and we're just going to gather around and lay hands on them. And Pastor Emmanuel, come on up and just pray a blessing, would you? Gather around. We appreciate you all and your leadership. Yes, amen. God will give you thanks. Give you thanks for this day. Give you thanks for your church. Give you thanks for your call. The call that will be set upon us, on all of us, to be the light of the world. So men can see our good works and glorify you who is in heaven. This morning, we would like to lift up our brothers, our district superintendent, Pastor Kerry. Our professor, Pastor Justice, and our brother, Pastor Byron, for the good work that they have provided unto us, especially the leadership during COVID, during the three years of COVID, their constant presence was there, not only physically, but through their prayers, through their times, through their call, through their support. So your work, the church that you have offered unto us, should be running and everyone, not only here in the city of Philadelphia, but throughout the US, throughout the world, can be benefited from the leadership. Bless them with you to do the work. And every one of us who are here this morning, keep us, guide us on the leadership so we can be one. One in the body of Christ. Not only to live, but forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. By the end of the day, could you just send a text to all three of these men and just say one thing that you appreciate about them? Right? Just just send a text and just say, hey, I appreciate this about them. That'll be a source of great Hey, thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks uh, to our district leadership, Pastor Gary, Pastor Mark, and Pastor Brian. We appreciate the many ways in which you have made our lives richer and directed us towards Christ. So thank you for that. Um, we certainly appreciate that. 
So today we're going to tackle the first topic of PCDC and I don't know if you read over like the promo sent out or the schedule that's sent out, but we do have a strong emphasis on uh, teaching, preaching the word this year. We have at least three sessions of PCDC that's going to involve that. This is the first one, which is about uh, developing a teaching team. The next one will be next month where uh, Stevie Step um, is going to be here. I don't know if you know Steve or not. Eddie, his brother, is the DS in Kansas City. But Dr. Stevie Stepp, he's an adjunct professor at, uh, at seminary. He will come and he'll deliver from passage to proclamation. And he'll take a journey and model for us how it is to develop a message. Um, and so I think that will be insightful. And then later on in the year, uh, Mike Jackson from Trebekah will be with us. And uh, he's going to uh, deliver uh, for us uh, some instruction on, and this is on some studies they've been doing, on how to uh, engage the congregation in living out the message, in participating in the message in real life. And they've been doing some studies and some research on that and been throwing out some projects and different models to see that happen. And so uh, Professor Reverend Mike Jackson, Dr. Mike Jackson will be with us also later on in the year. We will have a session involving worship and um, and we'll have some guests with us uh, outside of our own group here that will that will be visiting with us about the worship experience. We do have a, a one coming about, uh, you know, increasing, making the, the welcome warm on Sunday. So you, there's sort of a theme to the whole year, which really is, is focusing in on, uh, on our services and how we best glorify God, make people feel welcome and connected, build community, preach the word with power. So, but, uh, but that's kind of the direction we're heading this year. Um, I really encourage you, uh, you know, be here next month. Uh, Steve has delivered on multiple different formats in very strong ways. And, uh, and, and when Mike Jackson here, you won't want to miss, uh, you won't want to miss Mike either. So good. Any questions about just the general direction we're heading? Any thoughts on that? Everybody's at peace? Okay, good deal. Well, we're talking this morning about increasing our capacity through developing a teaching team. Now, I do have an outline here for anybody who's interested. You may have a way to take your own notes, but, um, but I'm going to ask if you guys are talking past that out. So, yeah. all right. And... Um, so, so the first thing on the, uh, the first item on the outline here, and I just think it would be a good way to open us up. I, I'm asking you to circle teaching or preaching and what's your preference? You know, people have a lot of opinions about thoughts like that, right? Um, is it teaching or is it preaching for you? Um, and yes, okay. So, so Jonathan, you say yes. Tell me why you say yes. Because I feel like... A lot of people don't have the biblical background that they, they used to have. So a lot of times in our preaching, I need some teaching. Okay. Okay, good. Good insight. Anybody else? When you hear the word preaching, what do you think of? What comes to mind when you say, man, I'm proclamation? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Conviction, right? Convincing. You know, I often tell people that. People say, Pastor, boy, I need some counseling. Can I come in and talk to you? And I said, well, you're always welcome to talk to me. I do want you to know I am trained in persuasion. <laughs> and I'm trained to talk a lot. So I talk a lot and I try to persuade you. If you want a counselor, there are probably a million better counselors than myself. So... But, uh, but give me a topic. I will persuade you towards my opinion on it. So, but that's what I think of when I think about preaching. I think about persuasion. What do you think about when you think about teaching? What's a thought that comes to mind? <clears throat> Educate. Okay. No. Modeling. Modeling. We talk about there's a few ways in which people change. One is that they hurt enough to change, right? They have enough pain in their life, so in response to their pain, they decide to live differently. 
and the other is what? They learn enough to change, right? They're taught enough. Somebody's teaching them. They see the instruction. They gain the insight. And they're like, oh, and that drives them towards change. Now, now I want you to do this, and I want you to keep this to yourself. We'll talk about, we'll get back to this in a, in a little bit. But when it comes to your, to your teaching, I want you to write a number one to five. How confident are you in your preaching and teaching? No, it's just one category. Jonathan, define that for us well. <laughs> you might give yourself a five as a teacher and three as a preacher, but anyhow, average it out as a four. So, but, but how confident are you in your preaching teaching? Think about why. Think about why you're at that confidence level. It's awful hard to teach or preach if you're not feeling confident about it, isn't it? You know, I mean, there's been times in which I haven't felt confident. And it's absolutely miserable when you don't feel confident. Right? But we have a lot of good reasons to feel confident. Right? The major reason, you heard John speak to that today. Right? This is what the Lord's doing in my church. This is what the Lord's doing in my life. This is what the Lord's been teaching me all of my life. And he said what? What's happening has very little to do with me. Right? So John has incredible confidence, but it's because of Christ's work in his life. It's because of who Jesus is. Right? So we have some confidence there. Um, but, but think about that. Think about it in and of yourself. Where, you know, how do you feel in your confidence towards that? Now, now let me ask you this, the next question. How many of you here currently are engaged or use a teaching team at all? Okay. Good, good. A couple people. John does. He says, I do. Sandy does. Because you're here. Nick said, I never pay attention to the teaching team. I do my own thing. No, he doesn't. So, okay, so a few, so one or two of us have. We have some experience with the teaching team. Okay, now I do want, I, I want to say this. When we, when we first, when we talk about um, uh, a teaching team approach, everybody has a different definition of what a teaching team is. Like I was talking to my good friend, right? He's a, he spoke to us last year. I was just speaking to him uh, yesterday and, He's like, what are you up to? I said, oh, tomorrow PCDC's on this. And he's like, ah, oh, I could never use a teaching team because I love the creative process and digging in and discovering it for myself. So I could never use a teaching team. And I go, well, man, our teaching team has never inhibited me from doing that. You know, but his idea of a teaching team was a group of people that sit down and they carve out the outline and you just fill in the blanks. Well, that's right. There are teaching teams that do that. When I was on sabbatical this summer, I met with the lead pastor at a church in Michigan, in Sterling Heights, and he hasn't written a sermon in three years. Not in three years, but he preaches 70% of the Sundays at his church. Hasn't written a sermon in three years. He has a team, and somebody on that team writes the message, and it's delivered to him, and he tweaks it, but he works with the team, and the, t and the team delivers a manuscript. Now, believe it or not, <clears throat> Some of the preachers that we see at all sorts of high levels, that's the, how the vast majority of them are operating. They're receiving a manuscript, right? So let me help you with your confidence a little bit. If you've ever looked at Andy Stanley or you've ever looked at anybody else and said, oh my goodness, I'll never be able to preach like them. They don't preach like that. Right? <laughs> I mean, they've got people delivering the content to them over and over and over, right? So, I mean, they deliver it with, with confidence, and they are, they're great deliverers, but, but somebody's giving them the content, and they might tweak it a little bit. Their personality obviously plays into it, their delivery style, but, but I mean, they're having a team deliver material to them. And, and so that could be one definition of a teaching team, right? Another definition of a teaching team is just a group of four people that uh, rotate teaching. And they might never talk about the direction they're heading in. 
So, so I'm gonna, I, I'm, I, what I want you to see a teaching team as, and I'll go over these three definitions and it can be anything in between. A teaching team defined can be a group that assists the lead pastor in developing the teaching schedule and the content with no expectation that they're ever going to teach. Okay? Now there's, a, there's, there's teams that do that. And then a group that shares the responsibility of developing the teaching schedule, the content, and the delivery of the messages. Okay? And it could be a hybrid or something different of the combination of the two. It's whatever you design it to be. So that's the first thing I want to happen in your mind is I want there to, to be a freedom about what a teaching team can be for you. It can be any of those things. You okay, John? Don't mind me, I need something right now. Oh, okay. So, but, um, but it can be anything you desire to do. So I want you to, you know, I, I want you to think about this. Before that thought, right, before we said a teaching team can be anything that you want it to be, right? I, I can think of a dozen different models of how teaching teams are used with the idea that, hey, I can, I can develop a teaching team that best suits me and, and how it is I want to deliver and, and what it is that I want to bring to the table, how often I want to preach, the, the content I want to pre preach. Um, how do you feel about a teaching team? One being, man, I just disdain the thought. I think it's absolutely anti-spiritual. Or, I love the thought. Man, it's a great idea. I want you just to rank yourself on that. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later too and, and, and see how you feel about it afterwards. So, I, so I, want to, I, I want to share a little bit of like, you know, I'm not the, I don't have the longest teeth in ministry here, but I have some pretty, pretty long teeth. So, um, I don't know, I think I've been, I think I've been teaching in the pulpit preaching for 35 years, 36 years, 36 years. Uh, most of the time, 48 weeks a year delivering a message. Now that's not foreign, right? I'm not, you guys are doing the same sort of thing. You're delivering messages after messages after messages all the time. And you know, when I first started off in Northfield, New Jersey, Right, Philadelphia District. When I first started off, I want you to know I come flying out of seminary at the ripe age of 24, and I had more thoughts to preach on than you could imagine. Right? I didn't need help. I didn't need man. I'm telling you, I had a long list of thoughts to preach on, all out of Latterich's church history book. No, I'm kidding. That was too long. But um, but I mean, I had tons of thoughts, right, of, of what the church needed, and I was filled up with all sorts of. And so, I mean, man, for my first two or three years, nobody ever had to, like, tell me what I should teach on. Man, I mean, I was filled up with all sorts of things. But there did come a point in the journey at some point after a few years that, that I started going, wow, whew, my ideas were slowing down a little bit week to week, you know. Not that I wasn't doing my devotions or reading the scriptures or, you know, but they were, they were starting to slow down a little bit. So, so I had a, a real revolutionary moment, and I might have mentioned this before, too, is I think it might have been my third year. I came home one Sunday and I asked my wife, which is great pressure, great pressure on your spouse, right? Honey, what did you think of the sermon today? You know, and you normally know by how quickly they answer or they don't answer, by the look in their face. You know, if they take a big drink of water or bite into their sandwich. And and so so Dora, who is a great supporter, normally way more complimentary of me than I deserve. She says, you know, honey, your sermons sound the same every week. And of course, you know what I did. I said, man, thank you for that advice. on yeah. and so, That's so eye-opening. Of course, I started to defend myself. Do you ever notice how we do stuff like that? We ask somebody what their opinion is, and then when they tell us, we argue with them. Yeah. Well, it's just their opinion, right? If they delivered something to you. We take a survey, we poll our church, and then they answer what they want, and then we're mad, you know? So, but, um, so, so she said this, and I defended myself. What are you talking about? How can they be the same? I, I don't preach on the same passage of Scripture every time. I don't, da, 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 da. And then she said to me, no, honey, but you say the same phrases every single Sunday. And then I'm like, 
okay? Well, I didn't believe her, right? So I, so I, I gathered like eight tapes of my sermons. This is way back when we used cassette tapes. And I threw them in the tape recorder and I listened to them and I went, oh my goodness. That is absolutely the truth. I'm saying the same thing almost every Sunday. And so we do say the same thing, right? Jesus is Lord. But hopefully we do say it a little bit different than I've been saying it, or in different ways, or or more helpful ways, or or or, or ways packed with revelation. But 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 so then I decided, okay, I need to figure out how to do this different. So so what I did then is I started to go to the Christian bookstore in our community, and I just started looking at the titles of the books. And I would write down the titles of the most popular selling books. Because I thought, well, that will give me some direction of how to go a different way and begin to think and, and say things differently. So I did that for a little bit. And then I and then I would I would I would poll the people. I'd say, hey, what, what's the topic that you think would be relevant to your Christian journey? And I just right, sometimes I did it by actually handing out a piece of paper, asking them to give me ideas. Sometimes I did it by uh, I just did it by, you know, anecdotally if I talked to them and I kept filing what people were telling me. Then I moved to this time in which I decided I'm going to have a personal retreat. I'm going to put together a teaching schedule because teaching began to become a burden in my life rather than a joy. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever felt that before, you know, but I was in this routine where I woke up on Monday morning and said, who, this is back in the day when we taught three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And so that's a boatload of work. Right, to think I'm going to develop three messages that might be somewhat worthy to somebody to listen to. It takes some time and energy. And, and so, so I, I just remember it feeling like a burden. And I decided I'm going to do a retreat and I'm just going to at least lay out a topical scriptural schedule. So I did that. Right? And I might have done it by saying, I'm going to take the book of Matthew and I'm going to preach through the book of Matthew. Or, I'm going to take the book of whatever. And then I bought one or two resources to help me teach through that, right? That's where I was in, in, that, in that frame of mind. And I did that for, for a little while. And then I got this idea of, um, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should pull some other pastors together and we could share what we have preached on, what some of our sermons were. So, so for about two years when I was in Kansas City, several of I, I pulled together several pastors and I just said, hey, tell me what series worked great for you this year. Hey, tell me what worked great for you. And we just shared ideas of, of ways in which they expressed themselves because I was just trying to grow my own ability, right? My own capacity to see and, and hear and understand. And so, so I did that for, 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 for quite a few years. And, and then that morphed into, into, into being a teaching team where we began to work on sermons together and not just share what we had done before. So, so I, I, want to, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the value of a teaching team to us. And, and so here's a few things that I have listed as a value to a teaching team. The first one is it increases your teaching capacity. If you have a team of people around you that you're working with to teach, it develops your teaching capacity. One of the things that happens is, of course, the quality of your teaching gets better the more people that you allow to have, your, have their hands on it, if they're the right people, right? You can become better at what you do. You heard, uh, you heard uh, uh, Mark say, I think, when he called, uh, when he called Carrie and, and Mark and Byron up, we're better together. I mean, we are. We're better together, right? More minds are, are better. Um, and so the quality increases, but also the opportunity for teaching venues increase. Like one of the things that's happened now is is with our teaching team, um, we have you know we, we have a traditional service at nine o'clock, we have a contemporary service at nine o'clock, and we have a contemporary service at ten thirty. So we have three services, but two services happen at the same time. So we have a team of people that involves both lay people and staff that teach in the traditional service every Sunday. Right? So it's been going about a year. I don't I haven't stepped in yet to teach there. I will one day but I haven't done it in, in the past year. But I never worry about that. I have a team of people that takes basically the same message that's developed. They make it their own, and they teach it in the traditional service. And I want you to, I want you to hear this. I, I've never heard one complaint. I only hear praise. 
they have a different person every Sunday that teaches them, right? A rotation of four and a person that teaches on the fifth Sundays. You've immediately increased your capacity, right? And so now what we do in that venue is once the, once the manuscript is written for the week, we just deliver it to the team as a whole. And who's ever teaching that week takes that manuscript and makes it their own. Now, our manuscript is completed normally by Tuesday at noon. But our teaching notes are 12 to 16 months ahead. So they know the topic. They know the passage of Scripture. They have the general teaching direction already in hand. And then that week, at the beginning of the week, they receive the manuscript. So, but, um, but you, just, you just can increase your teaching capacity. Another thing that happens is it increases your perspective and your creativity. So, so oftentimes I've, I've heard, and you know this because it's in the Word, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. Now, now I, I want to say that whenever I've heard that used most of my life, it's always been used as a presence passage. Hey, when two or three are gathered, I'm there. I'm there. I've just recently come to this idea. It's not a presence passage. Because he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. So he is always with us. Whether we're alone or whether we're not. Where two or three are gathered is an intensity passage. It's the intensity of his presence with us. So where two or three are gathered, the intensity increases. Right? So, so when, you're, when you're working together as a team to create something, the presence of Christ, the Holy Spirit, is there in greater intensity than if you work in isolation. Okay, so, so, I mean, we look at that and say, hey, man, it, it, it can increase my perspective. It increases the, 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 the creativity that can happen. It increases so many things because of his presence. It increases your planning for worship and promotion. So... So others, others can respond when they know what's coming. Okay, they can, they can do something about it. They can pray, right? That's the very least they can do. They can pray about what they know that it's coming. But one of the things we do here is we do series promotions, right? So whenever we, you know, we preach in series and then we promote the series, right? We don't think that's the end all be all. It's just one more invitation that we're throwing out to the community to come. So, for instance, many of you have done this, right? We preach the, uh, the, uh, the series on anxiety, right? So we preach the series on anxiety, only we know that's coming nine months, 12 months, 15 months in advance. So that allows the whole team to prepare whatever they need to prepare for the fact that it's coming, and it allows the people in the congregation to prepare, to pray, to invite. So when we recently had done a series on anxiety, we had droves of visitors to come in because friends invited other friends who they knew were dealing with anxiety and, but if I don't know what I'm preaching on this Sunday, that possibility goes away. The planning and the promotion isn't there at the possibility that it can be. So, so, there's, so there's, there's extra planning for your worship team. If your worship team likes to know what's happening and what's coming forth and they like to plan and and so I am a planner by nature, so it's like it, it, it leans into, into that process. But, but having a teaching team and creating that schedule allows that opportunity to take place. It increases congregational connection, right? You get more teaching points, more opportunities to connect. You have a wider range of perspectives involved for people to connect with. So, so this Sunday we had uh, Saran Stacy in. Uh, and Saran Stacy was, he played his football at a uh, kind of a subpar school out of Alabama. But in 1992, he was drafted by the Eagles um, in the second round. So he, like I introduced him and said he was able to have redemption in life. So he played for the Eagles for a few years. Uh, then he was out of the NFL, but he currently uh, has a ministry to athletes, collegiate and professional, and pastors. And we had him in Sunday. And, I mean, he literally is like, uh, he's like an old-time evangelist. Big, booming voice. Hardly talked about football. You know what I mean? At all. And just took off preaching. And it was a great Sunday and a great message. And I do want you to know, any one of you can have Saran in your church. 
because he comes for a long time. Okay. So we had a good Sunday. We had an extra several hundreds of people there, right, to, to hear Saran and, and hear him speak and so forth. Right? But um, if you want his contact information, see Cody. Raise your hand, Cody. Cody will give you his contact information. But anyone of you can have Saran here. And Saran, boy, I'm telling you, he will deliver the word. So, but, um, but he'll come for a love offering, right? Expenses of a love offering. So, but, um, but Saran, um, Saran left, and I had lunch with somebody this week. And the person says to me, and I want you to gather this, this is interesting. The person says, hey, Pastor, I need to ask you about this Sunday. I said, yeah. They said, how'd you feel about it? I said, well, I feel pretty good. He said, well, let me ask you this question. Have you ever said to yourself since you heard Saran preach, how can I be more like Saran this next Sunday? <laughs> and I said, huh. No, I actually never, never, never asked that question to myself. No. He goes, have you thought about asking it to yourself now that it's kind of been brought to the table? And I said, well, no, I'm still not thinking about asking that question to myself. And he goes, well, well, let me put it another way. He goes, when everybody left, they were so excited about Saran's sermon. How did that make you feel? I go, well... How do you think it should make me feel? <laughs> well, no, no, no. I don't want to say. How did it make you feel? I said, well, it made me feel great. Because we brought him in and everybody loved him. And it was a great Sunday. And yeah. I mean, if he'd have flopped, I'd have felt horrible. <laughs> he goes, no, no, no. You're, you're, you're not catching my point here. Um, <laughs> so, so, like, looking at Saran and then thinking about yourself, what changes would you think could come to mind for you? And I just said, look, do you have something you want to say to me? I said, just spit it out, right? We're all, we're big boys here at the table. Just spit out whatever you want to say. Just lay it on the line. And he goes, no, 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 no. I don't have anything to say. I, I want to hear what you have to say. And then he said, you don't want to hear what I have to say because I've been telling you for the last 10 minutes you're not listening. You keep asking me questions to try to get me to say what you want me to say. So why don't you just tell me what you want to say? Well, well, like, Saran had such a big booming voice. And he did, right? And he was really passionate. And he was, on a scale of 1 to 10, his volume was a 15, you know. Because when he first said something to me Sunday, he said, hey, how'd you feel about that? He said, oh, you ought to preach like Saran. That's what he said to me Sunday before we had lunch together. And I said, man, if I preach like Saran, I wouldn't have a voice for second service. I'm just right, my vocal cords aren't put together like that. So, but, and I don't have a big booming voice. I wish I did. I have a squeaky little mouse voice. I can't have that. That's way to do it. But, so, so it was an interesting, and the conversation ended up this way. I said, you know, I said, I think for all of us, me, you, we all have to be comfortable in a room. We can learn something from somebody else. But you know what I can't learn from Saran? I can't learn his voice. I can't learn his volume. Right? I'm, that's just... I mean, if I got up Sunday and, and tried to mimic Saran, people would think I'd lost my mind. <laughs> they would be like, who is this guy? You know? So, so I, I guess I say all of that to say, you know, uh, there can be an increase... There could be an increase in the congregational connection with the help of others, but be careful how we receive even their help, right? Here's another thing. Increases your ability to equip. It increases your ability to equip others. A teaching team can be a developmental time as others catch the way you're thinking. Now, I think most of us know this. When it comes to developing people, nothing replaces time. The more time you spend with someone, the more they catch. The more they catch on. The more they grow. The more they develop. As in that setting, modeling takes place. Another one is it increases your discernment for future direction. It gives you a place to process. Right? When we're, we're going to talk about what we do at, at Teaching Team. But one of the things we do is we reflect on where we've been and where we believe God wants us to go. So it allows us to spend some time processing where it is that we think that God has taken us and where he wants us to go. 
So, and, and a lot of times in teaching to you, you know, we're, we're not laser focused. We, begin, we process other things. As we're talking about teaching, you know, other things come up on the agenda. Other things that the people in the room are dealing with. Whether it be their personal life, or whether it be their own ministry, or whether it be leadership issues, a lot of different things come up that help determine future direction. One of the things the teaching team does is it decreases your anxiety and your stress. Because when you're done, you should leave with a plan. You should leave with a plan. You know, a plan always makes me feel better. When I don't have a plan, I'm always anxious. I'm always like, what am I going to do? What's the next step? Where are we going from here? But as soon as I have a plan, I'm at peace. And I can wait. I can wait forever as long as I know where we're going and what the steps are to get there. So it, it decreases our anxiety and stress. It increases your time for other responsibilities. A lot of times when we talk about teaching team to people, they'll say things like, man, there's no way I have the time to do teaching team. You know what I've come to come to know after after doing teaching team and the way we do it for 17 years? I don't have time not to do it. Because the time we put in on the front end saves so much time every week. It saves so much time every week. Because, you know, and, and you'll see, we're gonna hand you something here in a little bit that shows you kind of the end product of the sermon series. But but ultimately, man, you know, my process now is Sunday night I read over the teaching team notes, the passage of scripture, the teaching team notes. Monday afternoon I spend an hour or so, two hours, maybe doing a little bit extra ex exegetical work, you know, that perhaps the teaching team didn't cover. And then by Tuesday noon the sermon's done. Do you know how freeing it is when the message is done by Tuesday? To think I've got Wednesday and Thursday to do everything else or anything else I have to do. I mean, it is insanely free. And because that pattern's been developed, you know, and we've stuck to that, to that pattern, I've stuck to that pattern, it has, it has removed so much anxiety and stress. Um, from, because I don't know how you are, but normally, right, that's the big rock. Sunday morning message is the big rock. So once that's completed, <coughs> it just feels like a burden is lifted. So, so it, it increases your time to do anything else that you have to do. It increases the richness of your sermon planning. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna share a phrase here, right? Iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. We have rich times in teaching team. In fact, Nick 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 has been really the staff person that's been most consistent currently on our teaching team. I do say this. I always say here. I say, and this is just the way that I've structured teaching team. Is that it's a it's a yearly invitation. Like it's not a permanent position. The only permanent position on teaching team is myself. But but Nick's been on teaching team for how long? What? Ten years. Ten years. How long have you been here? Ten years. <laughs> but it's a temporary position for Nick. <laughs> so when he's not here any longer, he won't be on it. But um, so but um, but it's a it's it's I, I want Nick to share some value that he's gained from teaching team. And he's not the every the every Sunday teacher, although he teaches all of them. But Nick, take a moment to share with us some things you feel like have, you've gained from being a part of the teaching. Yeah. So, as an associate, there's there's different qualities I gain um, from from the lead pastor from Dave, and and a couple of those things. I think the most important thing for me is because we spend so much time in prayer and just speaking about spiritual direction at teaching team that I gain an alignment with my lead pastor on spiritual direction. Um, you know, and I've noticed in other, in other scenarios I've been in, uh, when I wasn't aligned in spiritual direction with the lead pastor, that creates a lot of conflict um, in, in the church and in, in our staff, right? Not that that's, a, that's typical of me, but, um, but I've noticed that. Uh, since I've been here, I've been able to gain that spiritual alignment. Like, this is the spiritual direction that God wants for our church. And now Dave and I and any other associates that are on the team kind of are able to grab a hold of that, right? And so it becomes an incredibly important aspect of my relationship with the lead pastor. And, and lead pastors, you may or may not know this, but people in your church ask your associates, why the heck is pastor teaching this? I don't know if, if, that, if you, that has happened to me no matter what church I'm at. People come to me and go, why is pastor teaching this? Why does he think we need this? And for me to have that alignment with the pastor... Um, because I was a part of the process, 
I was a part of the planning. I was a part of the writing of the sermons. Um, man, I have a depth of knowledge about why pastors teaching this, um, and and I'm able to respond to that uh, in a spiritual direction type of response. And then and then the other thing, practically, um, you know, when I was with family ministries and youth youth men and and, and kids men, to be able to align what we're teaching in all generations in the church. I have this crazy idea that some families still get together at the table after Sunday morning church and they ask their children, what did you learn? And if we've lined up what they've learned with what pastor's teaching on Sunday morning, now we've given the parents information to be able to carry on conversation with their children because they're all lined up with how they with what they're learning. And so that's been something that I've been, that I have tried to be intentional about. Uh, now, I, I, I do groups. Um, and, and it's the same kind of thing as what Dave's talking about. Having knowledge way ahead of time of what we're teaching uh, really informs me in how I de develop my teaching guides for our, our small groups at, at the church. And so where I'm not going week to week, I'm, I'm way out. Um, that can only be helpful for me. And then there's times where I'm called on to teach. And associates know this. Um, when the pastor asks you to teach, your job doesn't get put on hold for the week. You have to add that on top of what you do. And so for there to already be a developed thought, I've been in the room when we develop those thoughts, um, and then be able to save time in developing another teaching on top of all the stuff I'm already doing. Uh, it just makes it a lot less stressful uh, in the times where I get to fill in. So there's multiple ways that it, this is helpful, um, not just for you as a lead pastor, but also for your, your team and your staff. Um, you know, to, to do a teaching team type of type of scenario. So, so here's one of the things I don't, and I don't know if you're thinking this or not, but <clears throat> but I probably would think if I was sitting in my first church, I probably would think none of this applies to me because I don't have a staff. You know what I mean? I would think that, but then that leads us to the next question: Where do we find teachers? They are all around you. There are, they are all around you. We just have to see them there. You have lay people that have great oratory skills. Right? You have lay people that are around you. Right? Some of you have staff you can start your team with, but you have congregations. If, if you even say, hey, there's not anybody in my congregation I trust, you could get together with two or three other pastors and plan a, plan a teaching team a uh, couple days for planning. Right? And share your knowledge and work together to develop that and then and then pass on what you gained, you know, to your church when you when you return back. So there there are people all around you if you will watch and listen and hear. Okay? You can find people anywhere, right? I mean when 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 my eyes opened up to like when we were starting our traditional service, like how are we gonna how are we gonna do this? I mean, I probably had a dozen people come to mind that could preach without any help from me in a heartbeat that weren't staff. You know, so there are people around you that can do that, right? You have Sunday school teachers, right? You have board members. You have people that, that you can easily pull in and, and be a part of this team. So, so let's talk about this for a second. Let's talk about what characteristics that we're looking for when it comes to teaching team members. Because just like any team, you want the right mix. You don't want five of you on the team, right? You want the right mix of the team. So, so here's one of the things that I'm going to say. The first thing that you want is you want people that are emotionally healthy. Okay. Now, I'm going to say that because all of us have been in the group with somebody who is not emotionally healthy. They are a speeding train crashing into the station. And very little is accomplished in the group if there's somebody there that just can't control their emotions or their feelings. Like if they're in the group and they have to be constantly affirmed, you know, then every idea, every concept becomes an argument, right? That's not what you want. So you are looking for a level of emotional health when, when you're recruiting somebody, right? Somebody who can participate in the dialogue and, and, and as ideas are, are passed around. Because I want you to know, we've had teaching teams where people become angry. People become defensive. People have become convicted. People have found answers. We've had teaching teams where people have stormed out mad. And I want to say this. You don't handle God's word at the depth you handle it 
when you're in the room digging out messages? I mean, God's word is alive and active. It cuts to the bone and marrow. And sometimes it cuts the people that's in the room. So there are times when we sat around the room that somebody broke down and cried because of what was happening in their life personally and they felt incredibly convicted because of what we were talking about. We had times where people threw up their defenses because they, they felt the cuts coming too close to them and, and cutting too deeply. I mean, one of, the, one of the great things that I've always appreciated about teaching team for me is it is like a personal revival. It is like a retreat. Because the format that we use now is we go Monday through Thursday, one week, four days, we retreat. And then, man, that whole time, right? Now, we, have, we take breaks, obviously. But we are in the Word, right, developing the concepts, and we are, we are working this. And I mean, it is like a, a, just an incredibly rich time <coughs> personally in my life. But, um, but the first thing is look for emotionally healthy people. The next thing is look for people that are sensitive to the Spirit. Look for people that are sensitive to the Spirit. Look for people that have an understanding of the congregation, right? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you want creative people on there. We're going to talk about that. You want some creative energy. But, but right, every, it, sometimes I can be a creative. And, and sometimes you need somebody there who understands the congregation so that your creative idea doesn't become disastrous, you know? And so sometimes... We've had disastrous creative ideas, you know, and sometimes they made it all the way to go live and they were disastrous as we were warned they would be. And then sometimes they worked out okay, but nevertheless. So, but somebody who understands the congregation, you want people who have a knowledge of the scripture, people that know the scripture because you want to pull from the whole wealth of the word. Just like when my wife said to me, man, you say the same thing over and over again. You know what happens when there's three or four other people in the room? Then they give me input that's not mine. So now all of a sudden I don't say the same things over and over and over and over and over again. You know, it, 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 it helps me in that, right? It's, and even the scriptures that they pull out, right? I do have a pattern of scriptures that are in my mind that I go to consistently and often, right? But, but somebody else has a different set of scriptures they go to consistently. And that, that feeds in, that knowledge does. You want somebody who has some theological insight, right? Who can think through concepts theologically. Um, you know, I, I remember my previous church, and one time somebody said to me, you know, Pastor, we haven't heard a good holiness sermon, and da 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 you never preach on holiness. And sometimes I'm a little spicy. I am a shark when it comes to conflict. <coughs> so, like, normally if there's blood in the water, I tend to swim towards it. <laughs> So my response was, well, you know what's really sad? Even sadder than what you just said was sad. What's that? That it's been preached on every Sunday and you don't recognize it. Because they didn't hear the catchphrases. You know what I mean? So they never understood the concepts behind it. But, but you want somebody who has the theological insight, right? Who can, who can, who can help you dig through the, the, the perspectives of that. You want culturally relevant people. Right? People who understand the culture and, and people who can speak to the culture and, and, and bring some of that to the, to the table. Because the goal in a message is communication. Right? That's the goal. The goal is to communicate right? so that people understand, so that they leave and they're like, oh, you know. And, 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 and so you want somebody who's culturally relevant, who, can, who knows the language, who can help you be more culturally relevant. You want somebody who brings creative energy. We know this. God's word isn't boring. But some people have an incredible gift and skill to take the most exciting book in the world and make it boring. I mean, that's a talent, right? That's a gift that people have. And so, so I mean, right, having somebody who has creative energy saves us from that. Okay, I want us to take about a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll dive into kind of the end. And we do, I'm gonna give you the process of the teaching team. I'm gonna give you an example of what we end up with in our product. And then we might, if we have time, even break into groups and do a little exercise. So let's take a 15-minute break, and then we'll be back.
watching you not being able to turn it down. I like it. I like, I like that some of you. That's such a nice way to say it. You guys have to it. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's why you always start church on Sunday with a song. You know, at least you get their attention, right? But, uh, okay, fire in the hole, fire in the hole. Give you ten seconds to say goodbye to each other. Go ahead, hug and kiss now. Hello, Brother Wes. Uh, yeah, I've got it on here, the one you want to make, but you can make it. Yes, you can. I'll have Brother Wes and Brother Owen join me here for just a moment because they are going to help me make an announcement that I already have on my list. But they have a tight fit to that announcement, so I want you to hear it from them. Uh, first of all, the uh, Lifelong Learning Code, if you're interested in that, keep it up with it so when you stand before Judgment Day, uh, they can find your how many lifelong learning hours you had. I don't think anyone else is paying any attention to it, but uh, it's good accountability for us. It's 58976. 58976. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, just ask these pastors that fill them out rapidly when I give them <laughs> pastors like, uh, yeah, Chris Peanut or Jonathan Murky or Kevin Griffin. Uh, it's lifelong learning, lifelong learning. Uh, another thing is our email uh, at the district has been crazy. Um, we had this issue where uh, everyone who has a Gmail rejected our emails. And uh, Daniel Cook has been tirelessly wrestling that to the ground. So be looking for our new email transport on the MailChimp. Uh, we're, we're, we're going that route. The other route was not giving us uh, passage. So be watching for that, for the announcements. Um, we're having our prayer Zoom. Uh, Pastor Jonathan leads us in that. It's the last Tuesday of every month at 7.30. It's one hour usually. Um, so that always comes out, the link for that, usually from Jonathan and then also kind of from the district. You see it in both folders probably. Now, on October the 19th at 2 o'clock, this is going to be a very essential meeting for us as pastors and leaders. October 19th, 2 p.m. What was that date, Chris Peter, that I just gave? <laughs> He's one of my protégés. I can do that. I want you to get this now, and then you can hug my other dear friend who's been feeding me the last five days there for the clean. But... This is, is, see how essential it was? I've never interrupted anyone when I was making an announcement, but I want you all to hear this. Um, I'm going to ask Kim to ask Jonathan in a minute if he knows the date as well. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan. Um, October the 19th at 2 p.m., we're having a Zoom with Michael Thompson. He is our general counsel at the Global Ministry Center, and he is our friend. And if you don't think the enemy is looking for an angle to take you out, after Michael Thompson speaks, you'll know better. He deals day in and day out with the attacks of the enemy on leadership. And um, I was convicted to have him, um, honestly, by an incident recently that we have to walk through on our district. The Lord has given victory in it, so you don't need to worry. But I've been wanting to have Michael as my friend. Um, some of you know that because you called me with an issue, and within two minutes, I cut you off and said, here is Michael Thompson's cell phone number. Call him. And uh, uh, he is a counsel uh, attorney, but he's an ordained elder. So he has both ends of what we deal with. So he's going to do about an hour and a half. Uh, it'll be an hour and then maybe q and A. Uh, I'm going to leave it up to him. We'd like to bring him here in person eventually, but I can't wait for that. I need, I need for us to, uh, to have some leadership accountability uh, reinforced. That's, that's the best thing I know to say. Um, because, you know, I, my brothers and I have a, have a, have a pact with each other. Um, that if one of us 
is taken down, we're all taken down. Because we have the same last name. So, um, it's going to be important. I'm leaving all the topics up to him because he's going to deal with the latest things he's dealt with in the local churches and uh, the things he's having to work litigation for and all of this. So, before October the 19th, be okay to have your own assessment. Um, you know, your own assessment of how things are going um, and where you can tweak. Uh, also, uh, Brother Mark made this suggestion at the, at the DAB. It was so perfect. Uh, Jonathan Russell is also going to join us. He's going to be on the call. Uh, he's our attorney here. And he and Michael know each other. But sometimes Michael will say, I'm not practicing in your state, so you need to talk. You know, and I don't have a New Jersey connection, but, but I think Jonathan helps us across both lines. Um, so we may have a follow-up Green Apple Zone with Jonathan, you know, if we need to tweak some things for ourselves. So um, this is why we pray, right? But we also want to have our ears open. Now, if you can't be... Uh, with us on, at 2 o'clock on October 19th. I certainly understand that. I've already had people texting me. You know, I said, hey, I trust you. The recording will be made and sent out. Just send me a note saying that you watched it. And that will go in your file at the office. Is that important? Um, this Michael and I have talked. Um, we just want the accountability. And I don't think I've ever been in any of your files. I just want a relationship with you. But uh, we want to we want to be a district that really says we're on we're on the front we're in front of this stuff we're in front of it. <clears throat> Sorry, I made a big deal about that. This is also for your staff would be good if you have leaders in your church, uh, children's leaders, uh, you know whatever. Any leader can come and be a part of this, or you can take the recording after it's over and have them watch it. You know, but uh, I don't know all that Michael's going to say. But every time I I've, I've been in a session with Michael, I spent a week with him and. Joplin, Missouri, a few years back, that he and I were teaching together for a week. And uh, boy, I think I was there just to hear Jonathan share, honestly. It, uh, uh, Jonathan, well, Jonathan would have been um, got all mixed up now. Michael. Uh, and of course, Jonathan, man, he has been such a blessing to us. You know that better than me over the years. Um, next BCDC will be November 2nd, but we're going to have two in November. Uh, because uh, December is not working uh, for those who are leading. So November 2nd and then November 30th. So, I mean, it's basically the same, but it's in the same month. And I want to apologize in advance. I'll miss my first PCDC November 2nd because I am going to be in the Holy Land on a trip I had planned earlier. Some of you might be with me. But uh, I, I want you to know I won't be just sitting out, and I'll be getting the recording from Danielle <laughs> so that I can know where we're at. Um, Brother Bud Reedy's having an encounter day coming up. I think there might be a few slots November 4th at Kutztown. Um, his friend Kim Platt, uh, they're going to be leading together. You may have seen this information. We sent it out also okay. on Facebook. Brother Bud, I think, walked in. Right yeah. Thank you, Brother Bud. So stand up in case there's one person in the room who doesn't know you. This is Brother Bud Reedy, and uh, he would love to have you in this organic session uh, the time the word revival happened with this, so he'd be glad to engage you about that. But I just wanted to make sure we mention it. Um, Mac Weekend is coming up November 16, 18. Pastor Byron is the contact, of course, for all of that. Uh, and our district Christmas gathering, if you're saving the date, I hope you are. This year it will not be at Ephrata. Um, they booked something ahead so they can get rid of us for a year, um, which is fine. I understand the district can be a load. No, they had some other program they were going to do. And so Pastor Frank Short saved us. And uh, so New Holland, stand up, Brother Short, so they'll know you. In case a few people haven't met Brother Frank. So if you need directions to New Holland, uh, just put your nose in the air and smell good food, and you'll be there soon. But uh, this year, I'll make sure. And would you be sure your retired pastors know about it? Uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, let me get it here. It's going to be December 9th. First, uh, second Saturday of December, uh, 11.30. Uh, 11.30. Uh, I think we finish around 2 or something like that. Um, but if you have staff, if you have uh, retirees, um, make sure they're aware of it. There is a cost for the meal because food is pretty costly. 
these days. But I think it's probably, I told a pastor this morning that was asking about it, if he could come. I'm sure he can come. Um, but uh, I think it might be our greatest connection point as a district fellowship-wise all year. Um, so hope you'll come. Having a great speaker this year, Brian, Dr. Brian Charette is coming. I've been trying to get him for three years, and he finally had a year free. But he's going to share a christmas theme message with us, and, and you'll be moved by it. Um, and we'll talk to somebody about some music. Maybe Pastor Frank will leave us in some Christmas carols or something. Uh, Frank, I know you play guitar, brother. I know. Okay, we'll take that. Um, let's see if I got everything, because we had a whole lot of things come in here. Uh, okay, I'm going to have uh, Brother Wes come and Brother Owen. And, and Brother Mark, you have a trip to the Holy Land coming up, right? When is that? April 10th. Uh, uh, if you uh, ever wanted to go, uh, talk to Pastor Mark. I think Pastor Dave might have a trip coming up as well. Uh, you got one book, Dave? I do. Yep. Yeah. Ours is in April. April. Yeah. Okay. Starts off in So uh, the three of us, you know, we kind of have this addiction to the Holy Land. But either of us, would we're not in competition. I mean, you know, uh, we would love to have you talk, you know, about these trips. Um, they're life changing, especially for preachers. I, I, I mean, I am one. I are one this year. So come now. Um, if there's anything I forgot, just text me, and at the end, I'll shout it out. Uh, Brother Wes and Brother Owen. Sorry. Brother Owen and I have uh, announcements that are very close together. Prayer retreat is January 16th through 18th. And on that Tuesday, uh, Front Step would like to invite all of you and your spouses on your way to prayer retreat, Tuesday the 16th of January, to stop at Shady Maple on your way. And we will be hosting a Front Step Appreciation Lunch. And so our organization in Philadelphia cannot exist without the kindness, the love, the support, and the many tokens of encouragement that we receive from this district. And this is a chance for us uh, just to say thank you so much for all of that. We're ministering almost every day in the inner city. Today, Thursdays, we take our kids for swimming lessons because we discovered that uh, some of them said they could swim, but they can't swim. So we're in the business of saving bodies as well as souls. Thanks very much. It's the day that you're on your way to prayer retreat, Tuesday. At noon, but I'll give more precise de uh, details. Uh, I'm trying to get a window of opportunity with a separate room at Shady Maple, or it could be like from one to three type of thing. Uh, but we'll have a particular time when we'd like to all sit down that are able to make it. And then if there are some folks that have to be an hour or so later, uh, we'll still have the room open. Are all of these dates going to be in an email? Yes. Like Bullet pointed out, if we didn't catch these? Danielle's saying yes. Yeah. Danielle? Okay. And I'll pass. Maybe they're already sent out. She says yes, and it's yes. I'll pass it All right. Well, um, okay, no, if, if Shady Maple begins the prayer retreat experience, I'm, I'm expecting attendance to, like, skyrocket. Um, I mean, free, free Shady Maple, it's, it's good, good stuff. <laughs> Generally speaking, on Tuesday night of, of prayer retreat, we have uh, pizza together. Um, but if you are all eating a shady maple for lunch, I don't know if anyone's going to be hungry for anything uh, at dinner. We'll, we'll see what we're going to do. We'll make sure that if you are hungry, you'll be fed. Um, it's, it's an honor to be able to uh, start helping in facilitating the uh, prayer retreat. In the past years, West Tink has, uh, has been instrumental. And, and most recently, uh, Pastor Jonathan Murphy. And uh, I was asked if I would um, start leading that. And um, as long as God wills for that to be the way, I'm honored to have a part in it. Um, I was thinking about uh, when, when, when Jonathan asked me to do this, and in light of how incredible Jonathan has been as a leader, I was kind of thinking about the, the request of, of Elisha to Elijah when uh, Elijah was about to take his exit, Elisha asked for a double portion of the spirit of, of Elijah. And Elijah told him, hey, if, if, if you're seeing me when I'm leaving, 
that'll be yours. Well, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, no chariot is taking Pastor Jonathan away. Um, but anyway, I, I'm, again, I'm just so grateful for the way that uh, Pastor Jonathan has led, and, uh, and I'm praying that, that we'll experience it. I know, I'm, I'm trusting we'll experience an incredible time. Uh, the flyers that have just gone out, hopefully you all got one. If not, I have some extras here, and you can find me before you leave. You can even take extras if you want to give some out. Uh, shares the preliminary information about the prayer retreat. There will be more information coming out. Registration will open soon. Um, and it gives you the, the topics of what our, what our different sessions will be looking like. Um, it's, as always, going to be an incredibly rich time. If you've never been, um, I would encourage, exhort, challenge, welcome, invite you to please um, consider being there this year. Um, I know that you will not be disappointed. And um, just a couple of quotes on, on prayer that I want to uh, share that uh, are from E.M. Bounds. I think that these uh, speak to the need that is before us. He says this, Another scheme of Satan is to eliminate from the church all the humble, self-denying ordinances that are offensive to unsanctified tastes and unregenerate hearts. He seeks to reduce the church to a mere human institution, popular, natural, fleshly, and pleasing. Few Christians have anything but a vague idea of the power of prayer. Fewer still have any experience of that power. The church seems almost wholly unaware of the power God puts into her hands. This spiritual carte blanche of the infinite resources of God's wisdom and power is rarely, if ever used, never used to the full measure of honoring God. Now, that's pretty intense. Those are, those are some pretty strong words. I'm glad to say that I don't think that our district comes close to necessarily identi identifying fully with what Ian Bounds is saying there. I believe that we make prayer a priority on our district. I believe we've seen the power and the effects of prayer on our district, and I'm just continuing to challenge us. Let's keep on pressing in all the more to the power that God has available and wants to give to us as we seek to be his people and to be his church. Um, the painting here that I brought, if you were at the prayer retreat this last year, you know this painting. Part of you is on this painting. Um, we had all the different participants of the prayer retreat add to the vine. They add, uh, the branches were there, but we needed to add the fruit. And we, well, the fruit, the different fruit that you see on the branch here, um, on the vine here, were the prayers of what we were hoping for God to do in our ministries as a result of our on-purpose abiding in Him throughout this year. And I just want to give a quick praise, quick testimony of what God has done in regards to the specific prayer that I painted, or the specific fruit that I painted. I've been praying for our youth ministry at Westchester Church of the Nazarene. In fact, there has been virtually no youth ministry at Westchester Church of the Nazarene. Um, I stepped away from leading the adults on Wednesday nights and uh, because I've gotten out two teenagers in my own family. And uh, I said, it's time for me to start pouring into the teens. And uh, on average, right now, weekly, we're seeing 14 teens coming to church. Again, I attribute this to our commitment, not just what we did at the prayer retreat, but our church's whole commitment this year, our theme this year, is to abide. And uh, I'm trusting that as we're abiding in Christ and he's abiding in us, he's just making the fruit grow. And um, I'm, I'm just excited to see, as we gather again another, for another year, what God is going to do in us and through us and prepare us to do uh, for our, our lives and ministry. But thank you again for the opportunity. Be on, be on the lookout through emails. Um, for the registration so that you can uh, jump on this. And um, there, I do want to also say that the, the, the district does have some scholarship money available. So if there are any of you who uh, either yourself or your church cannot afford to send you to retreat, um, please reach out to me about that. And then um, uh, if, if your church does have the means of maybe not only providing for you to go to retreat, but possibly for another pastor on the district to go to retreat, Give, give some thought to maybe offering that to the district as a way that we can continue to make sure that those who want to go, need to go, can go. All right? Thanks, everybody.
Okay, so, um, good, everybody good? Feeling all right? Did you get all those dates on your calendar? All right, good deal. Email is coming. So we heard, good question mark. So, you know, the key to success is not having all the answers. It is asking the right questions. So, because somebody has an answer, right? So you have to figure it out, good stuff. All right, let's talk about the process of our teaching team. Now, this is what we do. It's not what, you know, but it's just a model. So uh, when we talk about scheduling a teaching team retreat, um, you know, we've had all sorts of different numbers involved. We've had up to five people involved. Uh, and currently, I mean, I think the last time we went, we have four, but we were several years with three people on the teaching team when we went. And the reason is, what we figured out is if you have more than three people, two conversations can happen at the same time. And so a lot of content doesn't get collected. A lot of uh, valuable information slips through, doesn't make it to our documents. Um, it becomes distracting if you have two conversations going on in the same room. So, so most of the time we found that three people really is the premier number to keep the conversation centralized. But we go, uh, we, we've tried different different things throughout the years. At one point we did three days, three days a week, twice a year, and we stayed local. We found that local struggled for us because as long as we stayed local, everybody's mind was still on the task they had to do here. So we tried to do, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but we said we would start at nine. We didn't start till 10, 15. We said we would go until 3.30. Normally everybody wanted to be done at two because they were trying to get everything else checked off their list before they went home for the night, right? So that didn't really work for us doing it locally. So, but um, then we tried two days a week every quarter because we thought we're planning too far ahead and the planning too far ahead, you know, maybe may cause us to miss some opportunities. And that didn't work just like the three day because we stayed local too. So where we're at right now, what we've been doing the last several years is we do four days of a retreat. So we go away. So nobody has to worry about what time they're getting home or what time dinner's being provided or if they're providing dinner or if they need to stop and see somebody before they go home. So we go far enough away retreat wise that, we, uh, that, we're, that we're pretty much in isolation. And then we break the time up. You know, we may go all day Monday, take Monday night off. Do Tuesday morning, take Tuesday afternoon off, and come back and do Tuesday night. Do Wednesday all day, take Wednesday night off. Do Thursday morning. You know, we just break it up to try to try to stay stay as fresh as we can in our mind. Because, you know, when you're digging in, and you guys have been in times like this where you're really working it, it can be, right, you're pouring out at a pretty high level. So, but here's our process when we get together for teaching team. The first thing is prayer, right? We just, uh, we really make sure we're, we're praying. We do ask people, we do prep them ahead of time. We'll say, hey, you know, we're coming up this year, be praying about what direction we should go, be praying about uh, where God wants to take us. Here's the list of where we have been the past year, you know, because we do have a because we do have all the documents. We can go back years and years of what our teaching cycles have been. So it's been like, hey, here's what, here's where we have been. Then the first thing we do after, after we pray is we break down the annual calendar, right? We just take the annual calendar and we go, hey, here's Lent, boom, boom. Here's Advent, boom, boom. Here's the special events that we're gonna have, boom, boom. Here's where, the, here's where other holidays are. And then here's the Sundays in which we're gonna be open. And now what that does is normally that leaves us with about nine series, right? Lent's a little bit longer. Sometimes we do a whole summer series. Sometimes we break the months up in the summer. Just depends on what is happening. But we break down, okay, here's the series we have. And then we <laughs> review what we've taught the last several years. We say, what have we taught, right? Because we're kind of, we want to create balance. You know, we want to make sure that we're covering the scripture in its fullness. So we look at where we have been. And then, and then we take some time to prioritize where we believe the Holy Spirit is leading us the next year. So what we do is we talk about the themes. So like, let's say, for instance, we haven't had a series on the Holy Spirit or holiness, right, for three years, right, a specific series on it. Although, as I mentioned previously, we're, we're preaching holiness every Sunday in different forms. But, but we're like, okay, so we would write Holy Spirit, right? Uh, <coughs> 
you know, a series on the Holy Spirit or a series on the fruits or a series on whatever it is that, that we felt like the direction in which we should be going. And we would prioritize the themes and then we would take the themes and we would fit them into the calendar. Like, for instance, one of our trends, and you guys probably do the same thing, we're not the only ones that do it, but one of the themes have always been, you know, it's always good to talk about the Holy Spirit in October because you can use all sorts of fun things like ghost as a serious title. You know what I mean? Paranormal activity. You know what I mean? There's just all sorts of like <laughs> different things you can do at different times of the year. So we do think about that, right? Because we also use this as promotion and as marketing. And is, you know, so so we do think about some things like that as we're, you know, one year we did a series when uh, when um, when one of the Shreks were coming out. And we called it the Ogres Within. And we did the seven deadly sins. You know what I mean? So, but just that's the culturally relevant piece, right? Somebody goes, oh, you know what? They're a movie buff. Oh, man, this is coming out, and this is coming out, and this is coming out. So we would hop on the back of something like that, right? And, you know, and, and, and try to plan those things out that also line up with our themes. Then after we put all our themes and say, okay, we're going to do this there, this there, this there, this there, we title the series. Now, we do try to have somewhat level of culturally relevant titles, right? Because that's really the main thing people that aren't at your church are going to see. Whether they see it on your website, whether they see it on your signage out front, or whatever you do, right? We do try to try to do some things like that. And then whatever we create, you know, we have another group of people that look at it also. And if it needs to be tweaked, they tweak it a little bit for us. So, But I think actually the name of the series we're entering now is, it is titled Winning at the Game of Life. But originally, it is actually the small group study called Living the Five. But when we brought back Living the Five, certain people said, hmm, that's, we got to do something better than that, you know, if it's going to be, if we're, if we're somehow going to connect. So, so anyhow, so the title was changed. But we titled the series. Um, then we create a weekly flow. Then, we, then we'll start with a series, right? We'll take a series. Like, let's say we'll take January and say, okay, our topic in January is whatever the topic is. Then we'll go through and we'll pick a scripture for each week. So that we break this, we break the theme down. Like, let's say the theme is stewardship. You know, I'm trying to make this as simple. It wouldn't be as simple for us, but we'd say, okay, stewardship. First week's going to be on time. Next week's going to be on talent. Next week's going to be on treasure. Like we would theme out each week. You know, that would blend into the series, right? And then we would, then we would pick the passage of scriptures that we're going to that we're going to teach on. And then we would dig into those passages of scriptures and other creative elements as we would develop that. Um, we would go back to the first week, detail out the content, and detail out commentary work. And we will do commentary work there. So we tell everybody, bring your laptops. You know, most of us, like most of us today, I think, I think most of us, maybe not. Like I have a, I have a commentary service, a website, right? So I don't, I don't carry my commentaries with me anymore, right? You go to a website, and there's multiple commentaries in there. So, but... But anyhow, so you can do you can do some commentary work when you're there, creative ideas. You can talk through what are going to be the congregational blocks. You can talk about the message flows. And then we just go by week by week. And we try to flesh out um, uh, some decent material. And we just repeat that throughout the, whole, throughout the whole year until we're done. Normally, we get the whole year done when we go away for four days. Um, after it's all done, we step back, we look at it see if there's any holes in it, see if we like it, see if we need to shift something, see if we need to go a different direction. But that's pretty much our process. And I think all that's written down here for you, right in the outline. If you have further questions about that, we can talk about it. But one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to give you an example of like what the end product would be. So if I could have a couple people help me deliver this. Now, I do want you to know my admin made this in, in book form. It does not look like it, like, like it does in this book form when we get done with it. It is just a run-on Google document. But we picked a series, and then I said, hey, we want to hand this series out so people can see what the end product is. And then this is what she came up with. So she put it in a book form. This is not what it looks like when we deal with it. You know, It's the hard notes of, uh, of what's there. But you can see from the title, it even has my name on it. I don't know if I should take complete ownership of it. But, um, 
But, but sermon series sample, this is a series we did, and we entitled it Junk in the Truck. Yeah. Right? So, and I think one of the creative things we did, we did have a, we did have a, uh, uh, trunks on the stage that throughout the series, whatever item we were talking about, whatever issue we were talking about, we pulled out of the trunk. So, we don't do that every series, not every series do we have an element like that, but we do sometimes. <laughs> The big joke tends to be whenever pastor is using an object lesson, you know it's going to go wrong, and it does, and so everybody laughs, and it becomes kind of a joke. But anyhow, so, but you can look here, and you can see junk in the truck, the way we broke this down. The first Sunday was about the rear view mirror, right, because the object is a vehicle. So we're talking about our past. The theme of the sermon is the first issue we must address is our past. So that becomes the theme of that topic. The next one's, the next topic uh, be, you know, from propping the trunk is a is a weighted vest. So you know what a weighted vest is. After you use that, they put it on. We talk about you know, and you can see also as you look at the passage of scripture, we're in Exodus. Moses is crisis of identity. Then we go to then we go to bricks without straw. You know, living life with this extra weight. Then we went to uh, then we went to the plagues, which is the which is moving from disbelief to belief, right? Which is Pharaoh's journey. Then we went you know then we went. You know, we had cones, you know, that represent something in here. But, but you can look through that because we just wanted to give you an example of what it is that uh, would be the end product. Now, I want to say for us, right, the way we, the way we operate here is, you know, uh, I teach probably 42 times a year. That's too many. I think I'm going to try to get down to like 34 times a year. Um, but then the 42 times of the year I don't preach, we have a faith promise speaker, we have, you know, we have normally two guest speakers a year, you know, for promotional reasons, <coughs> we just have Saran Stacey, we kick off the call. And so, um, so then the other times, those that are on the teaching team are the ones who teach, you know what I mean? So they'll teach throughout the year. So for us, it's Nick and John and Harry are the ones who uh, tend to rotate through the teaching team. And so, um, I need to I need to not teach so much and let them teach more, you know. So I'm hoping to do that over the next year, so I'll bring my teaching schedule down. Um, but that's kind of an end product as you look at it. So the pastor takes this, right? The pastor who's teaching now me if I'm teaching on a weekly basis, right? I gave my schedule. I normally read through the notes on Sunday night, right? Just so I know what happened. If I do any ex extra exegetical work that I need to do on Monday afternoons, and then on Tuesday is when I write the message. Now, normally I start in the morning. I'm an early writer, so normally I start in the morning by six, and most days I'm done by ten thirty or eleven with the message. So, but um, um, everybody else has their own rhythm. If you're not teaching every week for people on the team, uh, most of the time they know well in advance when they're teaching. You know, like like I think John, you're teaching uh, no, in November. last Sunday in November. John's teaching. He already knows that. You know, so, you know, so John's prep, you know, he'll have some time to be able to continue to dig into that. Our goal isn't to, to take away creativity or to take away personal discovery. Our goal is to create a launching pad that our teachers can spring off of, you know. So, and, and I'll be honest, sometimes, sometimes I open up the teaching notes and I'm like, oh my goodness, and the Holy Spirit resonates with me and the outline is there like that. So sometimes Sunday night, I'm like, oh man, I already know the message. I have it outlined, and then Monday afternoon, I'm done. You know, and then other times I read through the notes and I go, I don't have any clue what we were thinking when we wrote this. <laughs> but somehow the Lord always delivers at least a phrase or a sentence, and I'm like, oh. And then I spring off that phrase and sentence, and it goes, you know, the what we say is mandatory for us in using this is what's mandatory for us is you have your overall theme. You have your weekly scripture and you have your weekly theme. Everything else is a resource. So in one sense, if, if you might think about it this way. We're creating our own lectionary. You know, right? If you, have, if you, if you use the lectionary, you, there's tons and tons of service, right? There's tons and tons of resources. And, and so what we're doing is we're just creating our own. A lot of times there'll be a cut and paste link in the notes. Right, because we're because you're going to click that link and it's going to take you to you know a commentary. It's going to take you to an article. Or it's going to take you to so there can be all sorts of resources that end up in this document. 
But what we're trying to do is eliminate that all of a sudden urgency Monday. I have to think of something to say, and we're trying to provide you know high level of resources um, for um, for the team. Um, any any questions on on anything that's been talked about yet? I'm, I'm right. curious about uh, where whether it's a part of the team or it's a coach mm -hmm. part of the team is when you go from these ideas and the development of this to it getting on the screen. Like, is, does the teaching team talk about imagery or what we want it to look like? Sometimes. Sometimes we do. And we probably did that more uh, before we had a fully functioning comms team. So one of the things we do now is, and, and we're working in advance, so this happens for us, right? So the comms team knows next year what we're covering in October, right? So they work on graphics. They work on, you know, so they're developing the graphics. You know, and normally they're working, how far do you work ahead, Cody? Three months? Uh, well, we're done through January now. We're starting on Wednesday, so. Okay. So our graphics for our series are done through January, right? But that's the power of, you know, and you guys have people that volunteer and do graphics for you. So the, so the material works the same for them, right? So if you can hand them, you know, 12 months in advance, you know, we even use it, like, when we meet with our annual board, you know, we have a kickoff board meeting, we have a we only have a couple meetings a year, but our, our first one's all day long. They get the calendar of everything that's going to happen in the church all year. They get the preaching calendar for the year. And every once in a while, we have a controversial subject that's in there or a title that that is really <coughs> meant to cause people to turn their head when they drive by, which has happened. We did one recently where the person said, I drove by the church sign. I about broke my neck when I saw what was on it. I drove, I turned around, I came back, I looked at it again, and this is a person who didn't attend church with us, but they actually <coughs> sent a note saying, kudos for having the guts to put something on your side that causes people to look more than once. You know what I mean? Now, some people will take offense at it, but, and then other people are like, well, that was great. So, but anyway, right, it's, uh, it just depends. We try not to create too many kinds of things continually. We offend twice a year with intention. <laughs> so, but but then but then what happens every week once the manuscript gets done, we illustrate it. So now you know um, what we'll do is we'll take the manuscript and then I currently I work with Warren and we talk over the manuscript and see what can be illustrated in it. So like we're we're in this series right the the game of life. So if if I have Three point three steps to something, the life board will come up on the screen, and then the three steps will appear in the boxes, like the game of life works. You know how you do the game of life and it has little instructions in the squares? And that's what happens, right? And that's just stuff that flows out of the, you know, out of the whole creative process. But, um, and those are things that if you have time, remember when I said one of the great things that teaching team helps you with is it allows you to plan and promote, it increases the quality of what you do. So like if you have, like if like if your graphics person at church knows four months, what you're doing in four months, man, they could, right, they could, the juices can flow for them. You know what I mean? But if they don't know until next Sunday, right, you can do a PowerPoint presentation, which we all do, right? We all do PowerPoint presentation. Maybe we should, you know, but, but anyhow, um, you know, so it's things like that that come about. So, but. so today, can you take the mic so that we don't lose you on the YouTube piece? Oh, thanks. If you don't okay, mind, I want to hear. It. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Hey, just a sort of question, but I think maybe you would want to know. So, when you have men's retreat or you have a great event outside of the church, would you have to leave the retreat or other things? Would you have the main speaker then who is come back and share from your? Sometimes. It just depends, yeah. Like we had, well, we had Rob Taylor, right? Everybody knows Rob. You guys have had Rob. We had Rob come back, and the main reason we had Rob come back is because he's a former NFL player. And the title of our series for the month was Beast of the East. And, uh, and so we had two NFL players speak. 
right? So is that something that would have been planned out, or you're able to adjust as, you know, the speaker gets, I don't know how long the speaker gets the books, you know, you're ahead of time or whatever, yeah. but you can adjust and move things forward and out as well. Yes and no. So, right, most of the time we look and say, okay, is this a speaker that does, does this? Does that activity. Yeah. Now, I'll say this, when, when Kerry comes to speak and he comes to speak, at least annually, um, you know, we just tell Kerry to preach whatever he wants. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, but, and so normally he hits it out of the park, right? I shouldn't say normally, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want a great, if you guys want a great sermon on Abraham and Isaac, best sermon I've ever heard preached in my life. You know, Carrie preached here on Abraham and Isaac. Incredible, incredible sermon. So, but so we veer from that once in a while, right? And and that's okay. But but it gives us structure. Now, a lot of times when we have a guest speaker, um, we'll send the notes to them, and they they will go, "Oh, this is great! I'll use this." And then they then they spring from it. So yeah. But I think Rob Taylor actually did that, right? When Rob came, he took our teaching notes, and then he. Uh, did his sermon off of it, so. But, yeah, so. Owen? Have there been times when, during your planning, an idea has been presented to you as the lead pastor that you did not think it was a good idea, you had to convey that, and how, how did that kind of conversation, how did you handle that? Well, it's in group. So in group, all sorts of ideas are being thrown out. Literally, some of them are thrown out. But, um, and then they're thrown out. But, um, yeah, so all sorts of things come up, right? All sorts of titles and all sorts of, like, all sorts of different stuff is coming up. So, and, uh, you know, because you have three to five people in the room, you know, and that's why I said it's important you have an emotion, that everybody's emotionally healthy, right? That somebody's not hijacking the conversation. So, but the vast, vast majority of the time, Right, we all pretty much come to a consensus, but um, but I would say that I probably do have a veto vote if I look at something and go, mm, yeah, I don't think we're going to do that. So, um, but normally that happens during the dialogue. By the time we leave there with final notes, it's done. So, but. so Nick handles it well when you shoot him down. Um, you know, I never shoot Nick down, so, but uh, Nick flies so high, I often can't even find him. You know? And we'll look at each other during the meeting and say, where'd Nick go? Where's Nick? No, but, um, yeah, but I mean, there's not a whole lot of, I mean, like, when I mentioned that things happen in the meeting, like somebody gets angry, somebody gets, right? I, I don't want to describe it as though that's what the whole event is, this chaotic because it's not that, but there's times those things have happened, right? And it's just because we're handling the word, and people are in different emotional uh, places in their heart and life, and, you know. And so, but but it ends up being really a rich time, I think, a really growth time for us. I want to ask about adjustment. So, do you, in your time here, using this model, have you had times where you're scrapped the outlines, maybe something going on in the church? Well, you know, when COVID came, we we it was a real blessing for us because we moved, I think, five or six months of teaching. You know what I mean? So we so the, although we had it prepared, we went totally off what we had scripted. So, but yeah, we we would do that if something came up or something. So, but. But one of the things that I'll also say, and I don't know how the team feels about this, but but I think I'm amazed at how many times we planned something 16 or 18 months out, and then we went, oh my, like this was absolutely what we should cover, you know. So, but and you also have the freedom inside your message, you know what I mean? Most most messages you can carve a little bit if you need to to address something to. If we don't want to reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. can you and your team make this available to others through the district? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, and in fact, I would say this, you know, we have graphics designed already. I mean, it really, if anybody wants anything, 
you are welcome to whatever we ask. You know, we just give it all to you. You know, um, you know, even with this, the junk in the trunk, we would send you the graphics for it. You know, if you ever wanted to use that. Um, but at the same time, you know, all the messages are out there in their final form. You know what I mean? Yep. So, so you can find them probably on our website or YouTube or something like that. So, but in fact, I would offer this. I've offered this dozens and dozens and dozens of times, but only two people have ever taken us up on it. Um, you know, if, if anybody ever wants to come to teaching team with us to see what we do or how we do it, um, man, you're welcome to do that. So, but. Yeah, so, I mean, we started a version of that, because I came one time to you, and um, we started that at a manual. And I would offer the same thing. If somebody's looking for some series, things like that, we would be happy to share yeah. anything that we have. No. No. But it is helpful, cool. instead of reinventing the wheel. Right. right, right. And people at different times have emailed, yeah. and we've done that, right? Just send them the stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So, any other questions? To, to clarify, so you said the things that are solid that you come away with are theme, weekly scripture, and weekly theme? Yes. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Which really, that's most of what anybody outside the teaching team needs. That's what your graphic person needs. That's what I mean. And sometimes our graphic will change a little bit every week based on the weekly theme. The overall graphic will be there, but something in the graphic will change, you know, or the bumper video will change or something like that. So, well, first and foremost, uh, we are a nonprofit, so anybody who would sue us, we tell them we have no profit. We're not. No. <laughs> We've used all sorts of stuff, and it is interesting because people say, "Oh, you can't use copyright. You can't use." And there are certain things you probably shouldn't use. But for instance, uh, we did a series on Advent called Hunger Games, right? And it, because we, we did a lot of stuff about feeding the poor, and collecting resources, and things like that. So the series title was Hunger Games. We used everything from Hunger Games. You know what Hunger Games likes? Is when we promote them. <laughs> so, I mean, so we've done that multiple times, and nobody's ever. You know, there's been no response. I'm not advising you to do that. I don't want to be held legally accountable. But no, so, <laughs> well, no. I mean, but most of the time, most of the graphics are designed by our graphic artists. Yeah. Well, if you're on certain uh, web platforms, they'll censor you if you're using copyrighted stuff. Sometimes. Or sometimes. Yeah. So we've just learned to be careful of that. So. Yeah, Cody. Uh, Typically, the only time since I've been here we've gotten anything taken down uh, is when we showed the Grinch movies. We showed like a, a over a minute clip of it during a sermon. Video is the only thing that's ever taken a stream down yeah. for us. Yeah. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. In trademarks. Yeah. Same with us. We, we've been taken down for a brief period because of showing some videos. So. Yeah. It's yeah. usually Facebook. And even, too, even music. Music, yeah. yeah. Watch, watch music sometimes. Yeah. We did a series, The Blank That Stole Christmas, and then we used a clip from the Grinch each week to, to launch the, the topic. But, yeah. um, so, all right, I want to give you this. This is bonus material. I don't know how this is going to work. This is brand new to us this year. But um, what we're doing this year that is a little bit of even an expanse <laughs> to our team is, um, is we are, I'm having every staff <laughs> I'm having every staff person submit two of these. They're required to submit two of these. Everybody who's on the ministry team is required to submit two of these. And uh, and any other staff that wants to submit one can submit one. But um, and actually, it's funny because at our last stand up, our non ministerial staff was way more excited about this than our ministry <laughs> staff was. But, uh, but what it is, is it's a teaching series proposal, okay? So what's going to happen is we're going to have a series pitch party coming up in about two to three weeks. We have a series pitch party coming, right? So we're making it a little bit of a celebration. Everybody's coming in. We're going to have food. It's going to be like a party atmosphere. And all of the staff are going to pitch the series that they've come up with. And you'll notice here it says series title, 
date, name, series title, what the felt need is for the series, what the overall teaching truth is, what the scriptural basis is, and then a little bit of outline and creative idea for each week. So at the end of this pitch party, we should have somewhere around 27 or 28 series ideas. Okay? They're not going to be completely fleshed out, but we'll have 28 series ideas with a, with a sketch to the series. Now, you know, you could do that anywhere. You could do that with your board. You could hand this out to your church board and say, hey, you know what? You guys have a lot of great thoughts. You guys live life. You guys are Christians. You guys can, why don't, why don't each one of you, you know, in three months, we're going to have a little pitch party for the board. All of you come up with, the, with, the, with an idea for, for a series. Now, you don't have to preach that series, right? That's what we told the team, you know, because now that, those series will go to the teaching team, right? And, and so it's just, again, another layer of resource. Now, I got this idea from, from, from the church in uh, Sterling Heights, Michigan. And, um, and what, uh, um, you know, what they'll do, they'll go so far as, and this is something that you can process through too, they'll go so far as when a series is accepted, like, let's say, you know, uh, Nick proposes a series. And we say, yep, we're going to use that series. They've gone so far to say, okay, that series is going to be preached in six months. Nick, you write all four messages for that series. He may not preach one of those messages. But, and that's what they do with their staff team. You know, so remember when I told you the pastor hasn't written a sermon in however many years? So, that's what's happening. Right? He has one guy that writes a ton of them, but they are handing them out even to their staff. But they're so far out in advance, it's not like they've got to write four sermons next week. Right? They've got eight months to write the sermons. But that's the level of preparation a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the places are doing. And it's, you know, but I'm not, uh, but you do have to inform your board ahead of time. Hey, I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to preach this series. I'm not guaranteeing it's going to, but we're going to have some fun here. Now, that may cause some tension, too. So you may want to say, hmm, maybe I'm going to not give it to these certain people. You may want to create your own little team that you do this series uh, pitch idea with. But, but I'm excited to see how it happens. You know, when we all get together, we pitch our, pitch our series ideas. But we've got to leave with 28 or 30 ideas that then the teaching team will, will take. You know, and, um, and it is interesting that some of the most excited people is our database manager. He's like, what's that date again? And our facilities coordinator, and our, you know what I mean? Like they're excited to even be given the opportunity. You know what I mean? So you can imagine, you know, in your church, if you have some leaders, and they're like, "What? You want me to pitch an idea? Oh man, I've, I've had dozens of ideas. You know? So right, it's just a way to tap in and maybe gain some some extra resources and so forth. But uh, but anyhow, so feel free to steal that and use that. So, but all right. Any final questions or thoughts? Let me ask you this. How many of you right now have a preaching schedule that's laid out in front of you and in three months from now you know what you're preaching? Okay, good. How many of you say, man, I, I really, I go week to week? How many of you say I go week to week? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, but um, I would just encourage you to, to, to think about the planning. And I know we always feel like we don't have time to plan. I know we think that, we feel that. And that's a heavy weight on us. I was there. But man, it saves so much time as you plan. So, but. Um, Same question. Yeah. Do, you, do you have folks who have thought you maybe not this said, but Marijuana would say, yeah, I'm not really into that, or I disagree with it. What, what would their objection be to this? It's not even so much a philosophy, it is a philosophy, it's also a practice. What, what would they say? They disagree. They what do they disagree with? Yeah. Or, or maybe they don't. Maybe you mean don't. something with the sermon? Just this whole concept of you're the lead preacher, you should pick everything, you should, versus we're going to yeah. collectively get in a group, and all of us are smarter than one of us. Oh, there's people. Um, yeah, along that line, I've also heard individuals that have said, well, where's, where's the spot maybe of the Holy Spirit here? Where's, you know, how, all this planning, where's the Holy Spirit? Right. And my response has been pretty simple. Well, in the planning. 
the Holy Spirit's at work in the planet. But anyway, that's yeah. some of the. I'm just giving you feedback from things oh, yeah. that said from me to me. Right. And you know, I've had people say to me, "What? You manuscript out your sermons?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I do. You should be happy. I do. You wouldn't want me to spontaneously get up there. The things that would come out of my mouth, you guys would be like, "What?" So, but um, yeah, I mean, that, I just, I just tell them the truth. Yeah, I'm, I'm not built. Some people are built for spontaneity. You know what I mean? But I can't, I can't get up and deliver a sermon spontaneously. Now I can because I've done it for so many years. I can pull out a sermon in my mind I've done, you know, and deliver it decently because I've done it so many years. But, but if it was a matter of, of doing that consistently, you wouldn't want me to do that week in and week out. But there's probably some people who are gifted like that, right? They can do it. So, but I have had people say to me they were shocked I even manuscripted out a message, you know. So, but, so, and that was part of the verbiage. You know, what about the Holy Spirit? What about and that's where it's like, I think one of the things I might have put on your outline was, are you more spontaneous or are you more systematic? You know, are you more planning or are you more spontaneous? Right. And so, as long as you're good at spontaneity, that's fine. But I think we probably, the more we plan, probably the better the majority of us get. So, but. How much does the congregation know about this? Um, I don't know how much the you know obviously our board knows we do it um, and anybody who would ask we tell them but um, so so I don't know that we keep it a secret but we don't necessarily advertise it but, yeah, but a lot of times people will say where did pastor get that message where did he like I did something a couple of Sundays ago I hope you know and then several people were like well, where where where'd you get that where did I find that where did that I'm like, I don't know, I can Right, we just thought about it, we just thought of it. So, yeah, but, so, yeah. But we're not above stealing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, hey, look. So, I mean, I think there was a day and age where it's like if you, if you have used somebody else's phrase, they would say you weren't, you weren't genuine or authentic, but, could you talk a little bit? Now we don't steal. We like a message. We will. We will steal a title easily. Way more than we will take a sermon. Right. You know what I mean. So, but we we hijack titles fairly quickly, and then we develop our own stuff for it. But yeah, I was going to say um, you you touched briefly on this whole issue, which I think is a really important issue, on exegeting your congregation. Uh -huh. In other words, in terms of where are they at in their journey, congregational? Yeah. What do they need as you pray, as you reflect on that, as you talk with the people around you? Talk about how that, that helps direct some of your preaching. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the main conversations that we have when we're talking about where have we been and where are we going? What do we think God's doing as we're reflecting on the lives of those that are in our congregation? What, where do they need to develop spiritually? Uh, what actions do we want them to take, you know, throughout the year? So, so yeah, that's a major thing. And, of course, a major one for all of us is how much change can they handle? How much creativity can they handle? Right? All of our congregations are in different places than that. Right? So, you know, some of us can be as creative as we want to be, and, and everybody embraces that. And then, and then if your title doesn't sound biblical enough, you could be in trouble. You know what I mean? So, right, and, and knowing that is helpful, you know, because if you don't know where they're at, you don't know how to move them ahead. So, but it doesn't mean you always do what appeases, you know, but you know how much you can keep a measurement on the tension. Because nothing, nothing moves without tension, right? I mean, we know that. Movement is tension. So... What we've learned to do as pastors is we've learned to live with the tension, right? And there's times in which we increase the tension with purpose and intention, and then there's times we decrease the tension, right, with purpose and intention, right? So if we're going to move them. But you have to know where they're at, you know, or, you know, so, but. Anything else? 
And also, it's, it's part of the church, what we call schematic theology, it is an academic exercise that is healthy for the church. Right, right, yep. One other thing that strikes me about what Bud was saying is if you're getting sermon ideas from your congregation or from a, at least a you know, grouping, then that, they're kind of exegeting themselves for you. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Thanks for making that link there. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. So. I also think that whenever you can ask the congregation or your people um, what sorts of things God's working in their lives through, it forces them to face that question differently. Rather than you coming up and saying, hey, here's something that I see that you need to hear. When you can ask those people what it is that God is speaking to them or what they need to hear, now you always have some people who will not engage that question. It's probably but it will yeah. force some people to ask themselves that question. And you're already pastoring them. You're already uh, bringing them into the presence of God when you ask them, and they'll listen differently. Yeah, yeah, that's good. We're doing a series this uh, this year. Is it January? Yeah. Oh, there you are. You moved. So it's in January, and we're basically allowing the congregation to tell us what the sermon topics are mm -hmm. every Sunday in, in January. So, so they're gonna, right? We're gonna poll them. They're gonna, and then the top four is what we're gonna teach on. So, Dave, could you speak to also how this process, how it has also positively impacted the takeaway and the invitation, and how you and and those of us that are teaching with you how we close the service or how do we do that invitational piece because I think that that is something that has always been a challenge for me thinking through to how that informs how we want to close the service well you know that come, you know most of that's done the message is done our worship team meets and then we talk about we talk about the ending are we going to do an altar call are we going to you know, how are we going to handle that at the end and what's going to take place. But, um, you know, sometimes we have a call to action that's, that's physical, right? So they have to do something, you know, and then that's planned out in there. And so, but, um, and sometimes we do that at teaching team. We're like, hey, we want a physical action taken all month long. We want them to write on these panes of glass that are in the lobby. You know, we want them to, to carry this nail around, you know, and then at the end of the month they're going to drive it to the cross. We want them to. You know what I mean? But because but you can do stuff like that if you if you have enough planning time to think it through. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. All hearts and minds good? I was hoping. All right. Awesome.